Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Word of the Rings. This is session number 229. As we are now firmly back on the road, uh, tonight we're going to look at our third, the beginning of our third Hobbit walking party. Um, and uh, uh, looking forward to doing a little bit of comparison and contrast as we look at the Hobbits on the road. Um, but, okay, um... Great. Okay, sorry. I thought there might be audio problems, but I think I've got everything working properly. So, um, before we get started, a quick announcement. Um, so, for MythMoot coming up very soon. Very excited about this. There's still about a week and a half left uh, to sign up for MythMoot. If you have not yet, registration closes for physical attendance on the 9th of June. Of course, uh, MythMoot itself begins two weeks later uh, on the 23rd. So, um, we are, uh, but we're still taking in-person registrations now. Uh, it's going to be an awesome group. I've, I'm always so excited watching. Um, I get email notifications when people register for MythMoot, and it's always so delightful seeing people's names coming across the, uh, uh, you know, uh, across my inbox, watching that happen. Looking forward to uh, getting to connect with folks and spend time together uh, at MythMoot very soon. So, very excited about that. Um, I also wanted to make sure you guys knew about something that's happening soon. Here it is. Um, we're having a virtual open house for our Signum Academy Club. So as we're now coming to the beginning of the summer, it's a, uh, well, in some places, I know some people get out of school a little bit earlier than we do up here in New Hampshire, but we are approaching the end of school up here. Some people have already been out of school for a couple of weeks, but uh, as it is the beginning of the summer, it's a really great time for people to be thinking about uh, really fun, awesome, and educational uh, uh, opportunities uh, for kids uh, over the summer and, and then even into next year, whether you're thinking, whether you're looking for a really fun summer uh, reading, writing, learning activity uh, for kids, or whether you're, um, uh, you know, thinking about uh, like homeschool curriculum for the coming year, whatever it is, um, we would love to talk to you about what's going on at clubs. We've got some exciting things happening at Signum Academy clubs. Um, our students who have been doing, we have a, a number of students who have now been doing clubs for over a year. Our clubs program is more than a year old now. Um, and we have a, a, a whole bunch of kids who have been uh, with us the whole time and uh, just still loving doing their uh, doing their, their clubs experiences. Uh, so come and join us. It's going to be this Saturday, June 4th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, you can come here at sooner signumuniversity.org slash events uh, to sign up. There's a, a registration link here on the page. Um, and uh, you can you can sign up for that and uh, come join us to learn more about what's going on. Ask some questions if you would like. We um, are really interested to hear from people what uh, kinds of things they would like to do. We have so many options of what we can do for clubs. And so we'd love to uh, to be able to kind of meet with people and figure out how can we, um, you know, whether uh, some of the interests of, uh, of uh, some of your kids might fit with what we're already doing, whether we can put together a new club uh, in something else that other people are interested in. Really love to kind of get together, talk about what we're doing and hear from you guys about what you're interested in. So um, anyway, that's this very weekend uh, on Saturday is when that's happening. So I wanted to make sure to let everybody know about that and invite you guys to our virtual open house. All right. Um, and, uh, oh, and we've got, um, uh, we've got the, um, uh, of course, our space uh, modules for June uh, are just opening up now. We've got a bunch of really cool, exciting things going on here in June uh, and a bunch of new candidates that are being announced for August fairly soon, too. So really, really fun times in space, as always. More languages uh, coming in, more fun opportunities to uh, to learn about some of your favorite books or TV shows. Um, uh, space has just been really, really exciting. So, um, anyway, 
And yes, Middle, Middle Dave, we do have a bunch of our um, regional moots coming up as well. Carlsbad in November, absolutely, for SoCal moot. Um, we also officially have registration open for Mountain Moot in September. That's been confirmed. So we're going to be in Denver uh, in September. I think it's the 24th of September, uh, and the registration is open for that now if you want to join us in Denver for our regional moot. Um, I think the registration is open for Mountain Moot and for Middle Moot now. So we now have Buckeye Moot in July, July 30th. Uh, we have uh, Mountain Moot on September 24th. We have Middle Moot on October 8th, and we have uh, New England Moot. I think the registration is registration open for that? I think it might be. Um, uh, on the 22nd of October, and then we have um, SoCal Moot in November. I'm forgetting the date exactly, which date. <laughs> That's, I, I, I had most of them. Uh, I, I had most of them. Um, but uh, anyway, it's going to be um, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm really um, uh, I'm really excited about that. And yes, Nancy, actually, we are going to be, um, we were just talking today about uh, some of the input that we've gotten over the course of the month of April and May from our uh, from our Signum Strategy sessions, our, our sessions, our annual reflection. Uh, going to be publishing some of those uh, soon. November 5th. Thank you, Praise. Thank you, Praise. I almost had it. That was the only number I forgot. November 5th is SoCal Moot. So there we are. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the link for the club's open house for Mias Bujum, you can find that. Um, go to signumuniversity.org slash events, and it'll be on the list of events. You can, you, can, uh, uh, you can find it there, and the registration link is on the event page there. So um, anyway, yeah, lots of stuff going on uh, in the Signum world. Um, and um, I, can, uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, we're going to be making an exciting announcement at Mythmoot this year. There's going to be a big announcement, which I am very, very excited about, uh, and I think will be of some interest to uh, people here on Tuesday nights. Um, we'll talk about it, of course, on the Tuesday after Mythmoot uh, together, but people at Mythmoot, uh, attending Mythmoot, will hear it first. Um, and Jack, uh, JJ, it's even more exciting than the Long Division reenactment, which I know many people are looking forward to. Um, that was the suggested reenactment this year, which was that we reenact doing long division to like 138 decimal places like uh, Tolkien did uh, in his calculations of elvish regeneration cycles. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, that is so, yeah, fun, really fun, big announcement happening at Mythmoot is going to be uh, it's going to be great fun. So um, that's stuff that's happening that's coming up soon so let but with all that said let's jump back into our road trip so i call this the third road trip um because of course it's it's interesting to think about it in these terms um and it's one interesting way to kind of go back and sort of contextualize the growth of the characters really and the growth of the story really as a whole um uh and i don't think that this was something that Tolkien kind of envisioned that he necessarily like planned it this way. Um, but it's a really interesting effect. Think about because we have three occasions so far, right? We have the occasion when Pippin and Merry and Sam set out walking from Hobbiton to Buckland, right? So we had the first road trip, the first, the first Hobbit walking party. And then the second Hobbit, Hobbit walking party heading out from Buckland to Rivendell, right? Ultimately, though, so, you know, things happen along the way. Um, and then the third time, right now we have the third road trip when we're setting out from Rivendell to Mount Doom. Um, and I think it's really interesting. There's so many things that are interesting to compare about those things. Right. I mean, look, look at the way it grows in 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 scope in so many ways. Right. Um, the growth in length of trip, for one thing. Right. Um, I mean, the scale is really fascinating there, but it's not just scale and distance. Right. Um, I don't mean it's it's a, a merely proportionate growth in distance, though, though it is that right as well. Um, but it's also the significance of what they're doing. Right. Think about how Frodo spoke of the walking trip across the Shire. Right. It was a purely optional thing. Right. 
um, you know, they could have they could have driven, right? They could have driven a cart or carriage um, across the Shire. Um, but he decided to walk both for pleasure and for a last look at the Shire and in order to get himself a bit into training, right? So it's just a sort of a practice, fun exercise, right? Which, of course, turns out to be a life and death thing as the Black Riders almost catch them. Um, so, you know, just... A, a, you know, even very soon after they set out, it becomes more serious than it was uh, when they left. But still, they don't really think much of that trip at all, especially at the beginning. The second time when they set out, um, think about the song that uh, Mary and Pippin have prepared. Mary, Pippin, and Sam, right? The conspirators have prepared in Conspiracy Unmasked the uh, the version, the new version of the of the dwarfs, right? The far over the misty mountains, cold. Um, uh, you know, remix that they do. Um, think of what that shows about the sense of the occasion, right? Um, they are aware that they are departing on a significant journey, right? Even Frodo doesn't really think of, on the one hand, leaving Bag End it's, is really significant, right? I'm not trying to downplay the significance of his moving out of Bag End, which is a big deal, right? And yet there's a sense in which... Um, his exile has begun, but not yet, like, totally officially yet, right? Because there's still an element, anyway, of, you know, as he talked about with Gandalf, of, of returning home to going to Buckland, right? That's where he grew up originally and everything. So he's not yet set off on the one-way trip, right? The there and not coming back again trip that he was sort of foreboding when he was talking to Gandalf back in Chapter 2 of Book 1. Um, but... Then when they set out uh, from Buckland, right, especially with the, the really quick turnaround. Now the Black Riders are chasing them. They're going to have to leave before sunup of the next day. Uh, if you think about this, right, Frodo and Sam, uh, Frodo, Sam, and Pippin don't ever see the sun in Crick Hollow, right? I mean, they only spend, uh, you know, they spend like, what do they spend, like nine hours or something in Crick Hollow? Like it's a very short amount of time. Um, all during that one night and before the sun rises, right? So, um, uh, so they never they never see the sun in Buckland at all, uh, actually, when they're when they're going through. Um, and uh, and yes, Evil Doctor Ken and I agree. The second trip does seem most parallel to Bilbo's trip in the Hobbit, or at least I'd say um, that they are thinking about it that way. I mean, the, 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 the rehash of the dwarf song explicitly puts us, it shows us that this is how they're thinking about it, right? Um, they know that this is peril to, and it's a big deal. They're setting off on adventure. Now again, to Frodo, it means something else. It means setting off into what he feels is likely to be exile, right? It was the word that he used. Um, but for Merry and Pippin, especially, uh, for them, it means finally going off on an adventure of their own, right? They've they've grown up hearing old Mr. Bilbo's stories, right? I know that's Sam's quote I'm quoting there, but Mary and Pippin have grown up hearing Bilbo's stories too, and clearly pining for adventure. Both of them have more than enough tookishness in them, even though Mary is a brandy buck. He's got plenty of tookishness in him too. He's also a descendant of the old took. Um, but anyway, they have, uh, I mean, everybody's a descendant of the old took. The old took is like Queen Victoria, right? Everybody's descended from Queen Victoria. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, they, they uh, that's what happens, I guess, when you're like a famous person and have like 18 children or whatever. Um, but um, uh, anyway, so it's, um, they, they, they are, they see themselves as setting off on another, you know, Tookish, Bilbonic adventure, right? Uh, that they're that they're headed off on, which means that that second departure, it's a bigger deal. This is not just a trial run. This is not just a a, 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 a Hobbit walking party. It's literal. The first one is literally a Hobbit walking party, right? Um, and the second time, it's more serious than that, right? Um, and yet, um, still, think of what that looks like in retrospect when we think about the departure from Rivendell. Right. And the road that they're now setting off on um, what was an adventure, a probable there and back again trip, at least in the minds of Mary and Pippin, I think fairly, fairly clearly, um, uh, uh, is that they um, 
they they so they were thinking about it as a there and back again trip. Um, only Bilbo, in his stalwart insistence, you know, we were looking at his own, his departing his parting words to Frodo, right, in which he was actively attempting to encourage Frodo to think of this as a there and back again trip, right? But we know that Bilbo, in saying those things, is deliberately moving against the tide, right? He's he's trying to counter the way that everyone is natural, what seems most rational to think about this as a probable one-way trip. I mean, it may even be most rational to think of this as a probable suicide mission that Frodo is on. Um, Frodo's odds of survival are very low, right? Um, and again, from any sort of rational assessment uh, of of what's going of what's going off. Now, Nancy, you're very right that not all the Tooks who set off with Gandalf came back again, right? But that's exactly what's so interesting, isn't it, about Merry and Pippin's attitude um, in the conspiracy unmasked, right? Um, their attitude seems to be untrue to even that version, right, of it. I mean, even if they're thinking of it like this is going to be like another one of those adventures where, you know, Gandalf, that Gandalf has sent hobbits on in before and now it's finally our turn, right, uh, to go and do that and this is going to be awesome. Um, I think they're forgetting even the fact that some of the hobbits that got sent off on Mad Adventures didn't come back. Right. Um, it's a little more serious, e even as Gandalf quasi organized <laughs> Gandalf uh, 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 Hobbit adventure. Um, even that is not quite they're not thinking about the, even that realistically. Right. And again, notice, remember how we can we got that cue with Pippin's response to the song. Right. When they um, you know, we must away our break of day is the repeated uh, phrase, right, just as it was in the original dwarf song. And Frodo immediately takes that up, right? Um, well, you know, we have a great deal of work to do if we're to get away before the break of day. And remember what Pippin says, right? Pippin says, oh, that was poetry. You don't really mean to leave before the break of day, do you? Right? It, it, we can see, as we talked about at the time, the gap between what's actually happening and the even the concept that they have, right? Pippin's concept of the kind of story they're in, the kind of adventure that they're undertaking, is still, he's not really taking it literally. He's not taking it seriously, um, in a sense. Um, but, um, but yeah, this is, uh, now they're leaving before the break of day again, or it's been pushed back, right? They're leaving after sundown instead of before the break of day. It's way before the break of day, right? Uh, they're leaving just after the close of day. Now, um, what was merely a very early start on their second trip has become, we shall now travel entirely by night, right? Um, in darkness. It's a totally different atmosphere in so many ways for this third trip. Um, so anyway, it's interesting to think about, and, and, and you know, you think of then accompanying that where the characters are, right? You look at Frodo, right? Where Frodo was when he set out from Bag End, right? Where he was in his mind. You know, he this was a, a big moment for him. He was saying goodbye to the Shire. It's one of the reasons that he wanted to take that walking party, right? Um, but he still didn't, almost like Pippin, it wasn't real to him in some ways, right? Like Gandalf had talked about the spies of the enemy, but he didn't actually expect a ring wraith to show up on, you know, the gaffer's doorstep, um, coming up to Bag End on the very day that he's leaving, right? So, uh, his perspective has changed. And then, of course, when he's setting out for the old forest, he's in a different place. But again, you think of the sort of naivete involved there also, right? Um, that seemed like a very shrewd Desperate was his word, right? Um, it's a desperate move to go through the old forest, but um, but necessary, right? But he had no idea what he was in for, right? His first steps through the old forest and then through the Barrow Downs, you know, if not for the pro providential encounter with Tom Bombadil, no way they would have survived even the very first stages of that second journey. So again, we see, even though... 
he's now undertaking it with more seriousness, with a clear sense of the danger and concern for the lives of his friends, not wanting to bring them along. Right. That's been one of the other kind of undercurrents. Um, Frodo, Frodo's sense of the seriousness and danger of the mission of the journey. Right. Being far beyond that of his friends, right? Um, which we see was very true in uh, the Conspiracy Unmasked. And of course, we came back to that again, that same dynamic again, before the beginning of the third road trip, right? With the um, projected exclusion of Merry and Pippin from the party by Elrond and their response to that and Gandalf's championing of them, of course. Um, they still, Gandalf acknowledges, they still don't get it. They still don't know what's going to lie ahead of them, right? They're still naive, um, but, but they're not in the same place where they were, right? They would still wish that they dared. Um, they're not simply ignorant of what they are still ignorant, right? Uh, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to be asked of them. They don't know how they're going to be changed by, um, you know, the road that is ahead of them, but they do, um, they now understand that they're, they're, they're no longer talking like they're just out on a. Uh, there and back again, Lark, that they're like they're on some kind of Hobbit adventure, right? Um, yeah, so anyway, it's a really fun moment to kind of go back and, and sort of take stock of this. And you think, of course, it's hard for me not to then move one step further um, and think about Tolkien's own understanding of this, right? Not only how the Hobbits and their perspective have changed, but how Tolkien's own perspective has changed, right? How this story has grown, Um you know, so not just the characters within the story and their own sense of what's happening, but Tolkien's own sense of the story um, and what is at stake and what's going on. Right. Um, and we can see the same sort of thing. Like Marion Pippin, Tolkien himself does not really know the road that lies in front of him. Right. Um, remember, for those of you who studied the Return of the Shadow and the Treason of Isengard and the War of the Ring with me um, in the Mythgard Academy series, uh, you'll remember that um, when he's in Rivendell here, when Tolkien gets to Rivendell, which he did like five or six, or seven times, um, he, because uh, he kept rewriting book one, um, when he gets there, he genuinely believes he's halfway done with the story. Like, he he thinks the story's halfway over. Um, that's very clear from his outlining and, and other things that are happening. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, he, he, he has no idea. He has no idea what's in store for him. Um, and it's wonderful to see, right? It's just delightful to see that when you... But again, it's so uh, all along, this same kind of growth, growing up, the same kind of discovery is happening uh, as we go through. So I just wanted to kind of pause a moment because I think that this is a, uh, a really fun way to kind of put some of these things in perspective and get a glimpse at the sort of bigger picture here. Um, and um, I, and it's germane to the paragraphs we're going to be looking at today um, because you're, so you remember in the last uh, session, sorry, I, uh, I put it, I moved it all the way to the end. Hang on. See, I keep them around, the old slides. Hang on. I got it right. Yeah, let's go back to this one here. Okay, that's the one I want. Um, I keep them around in case I want to refer back to them. So this is what we looked at last time, right? Um, and you'll remember, the, think of the, like the narrative positioning, like the narrative perspective of this passage, and watch how it changes, right? Um, so listen to the, and tell me if you can, you can hear the shift in register between these two paragraphs and the paragraphs we're going to talk about today. At the ford of Bruinen they left the road, and turning southwards went on by narrow paths among the folded lands. Their purpose was to hold this course west of the mountains for many miles and days. The country was much rougher and more barren than in the green vale of the great river in Wilderland on the other side of the range, and their going would be slow, but they hoped in this way to escape the notice of unfriendly eyes. Notice how far away we are from, like, what's occurring. Right. That is from like what the characters are seeing and hearing and smelling. Right. As they walk through the land, we're talking about the map. We're talking about their general plans and intentions. Right. We're not really kind of zooming into, you know, 
than like Gandalf stepped over a fallen log, right? We're not talking about kind of that level of narrative. We're very, really far from that level of descriptive narrative, right? And then even then in the second paragraph there, Gandalf walked in front and with him went Aragorn, who knew this land even in the dark. The others were in file behind and Legolas, whose eyes were keen, was the rear guard, right? So then if we go back to today's passage... The first part of their journey was hard and dreary, and Frodo remembered little of it save the wind. For many sunless days an icy blast came from the mountains in the east, and no garment seemed able to keep out its searching fingers. Though the company was well clad, they seldom felt warm, either moving or at rest. They slept uneasily during the middle of the day, in, in some hollow of the land, or hidden under the tangled thorn bushes that grew in thickets in many places. In the late afternoon they were roused by the watch, and took their chief meal, cold and cheerless as a rule, for they could seldom risk the lighting of a fire. In the evening they went on again, always as nearly southward as they could find a way. At first it seemed to the hobbits that although they walked and stumbled until they were weary, they were creeping forward like snails, and getting nowhere. Each day the land looked much the same as it had the day before, yet steadily the mountains were drawing nearer. South of Rivendell they rose ever higher and bent westwards, and about the feet of the main range there was tumbled an ever wider land of bleak hills and deep valleys filled with turbulent waters. Paths were few and winding, and led them often only to the edge of some sheer fall or down into treacherous swamps. Okay. Um, all right, so... Do you hear the change? And it changes again, I would say, right? We, we've got those the, the last two paragraphs from the last slide. And then I would argue that the, the sort of the narrative perspective changes at the start of this first paragraph. And then I think it changes again um, at the start of the second paragraph. Um, uh, okay, so what happens? What's the difference? What are we getting in that first paragraph here on this slide? Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, I see several people. Ed Almarea says this, this, uh, this paragraph, um, embodies all the things I hate about camping perfectly. Um, yes, yes. Agreed. Um, Drosnik says that he loves the, uh, uh, the searching fingers line. I know exactly what the characters are feeling when I, when I read it. Yes. Notice how much it gives the, um, gives the tactile experience right? Um, before we were getting this distant sort of synopsis, right? Here's the region that they're going through. Here's a little bit about how that land kind of, you know, the, the folded countryside and everything. Um, here's who's leading them. Here's what their plans were and why they're going this way instead of going over here on this other place on the map, right? Again, that, 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 um, um, that paragraph would have made a, a nice, um, you know, kind of voiceover to be read while looking at a map, right? That's that's the kind of per narrative perspective that it was. This is um, a, a, from a very different perspective, right? Here, Tolkien is bringing us to feel what it was like being on this trip, right? Um, the first part of their journey was hard and dreary. The first part of their journey was hard and dreary. Those are two really interesting adjectives um, to describe the first part of their journey, aren't it? And notice um, what it cap what those what those adjectives are designed to capture, right? They both have something interesting in common. Um, there's a lot of ways that you could finish that independent clause, right? The first part of their journey was, you know, there are lots of the there there are lots of ways you could finish that, right? Um, by finishing it with hard and dreary, right? He is emphasizing how they found it, right? Their experience of the first part of the journey. Right now we're getting into where we were kind of looking down on them from above, right from a a, a, a pretty significant height, um, even from the height almost like a map height, right? Um, uh, looking at their journey and thinking about sort of abstract things like their marching order, right? 
which is, I, I say abstract. It's not abstract. Their marching order is very concrete uh, and helps us to picture them walking. But again, it's it's abstract in the sense of not being attached to any particular occasion. Or again, it, it gives us a picture, but it's still kind of a rem- remote from their experience, right? Um, hard and dreary give gives us, those two adjectives gives us these two different windows, not into what happened during the first part of their journey, right? Not to what lands they cross in the first part of their journey, not to, um, again, there's, it, it says nothing about plot, and it says only something about their own feelings, their own experiences, right? Um, the first part of their journey was hard. It was hard, that first part of their journey. It was, it was difficult. Um, and it's it's a sort of a vague word. Like a journey can be hard in several different ways, right? Um, but it was it was it was not fun. It was not fun. Um, well, it was not fun in two different ways, right? It was hard. By which I I take that to mean at the least um, like um, physically challenging, right? Um, exhausting. Um, uh, this is a um, it, it involved a lot of uh, advanced level hiking, right? These were not gentle trails uh, that they're walking on. Um, it was a, it was, it was the first part of their journey was hard, um, but it was also it's not it wasn't just hard. It was also dreary. You can you can ha- you can be on a hard journey on a beautiful sunny day, right? Um, you know you can be hiking up a mountain. You can be doing a challenging hike up a mountain and still be able to you know, sit down on the rocks and, and, you know, enjoy the fresh breeze and bright sunshine. Right. Um, but it, that's not the kind of hard journey they were having. Right. Um, when they did stop and rest, it was dreary. Right. So we have their experiences of the physical journey and their sort of emotional experiences of sort of the journey and the weather and everything um, at the same time, right? Um, it was hard and dreary, depressing as well as exhausting. Um, yeah, uh, Fort Thomas, I love that. Um, uh, I wonder if hard takes on a double meaning, both difficult and also literally, literally hard, like they're walking over frozen and stony ground. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, I, that second meaning would have to be, is kind of a, is kind of a pun. Um, but, um, but I, that, I think that's, that's kind of fun. Um, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Bjorning, I missed that. Someone said joyless struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the two things, the joylessness, the dreariness, um, and the struggle. Um, and those two things together, right? A joyless struggle, that is not a fun time, right? I mean, struggles can be fun. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, something that's uh, pleasant can be done in dreary circumstances that, you know, kind of have to be emotionally overcome, right? Or whatever. Um, but when you get both, it's tough. That's tough, isn't it? Right? Um, but... Um, yeah, and Captain Mo, I think you're absolutely right to remember that in retrospect, the first part of this journey is going to seem like, I mean, I can only imagine that when Frodo and Sam look back from, you know, a, you know, the bottom of a shallow pit on the plains of Gorgoroth, they're going to think that this first part of their journey was maybe not all that hard after all, right? Um but um, uh, but yeah, yeah, no, it's but but still that too, right, helps us to contextualize, right? I mean, it's one of the things that we see is the way that the story grows and the way that things change. There's so much more. There's so many different things at stake when we look at where we are, right, where the characters are, where the story is, where we are as readers, right, at these different stages in the story. Um you know, you look backwards and it's like radical change, right? A radically different thing. Um, but um, Frodo remembered little of it and Frodo remembered little of it save the wind. 
Um, so it was hard and dreary. Um, now, again, this is not the same as, like, completely torturous. It was just... Frodo remembered little... Like, it, it just didn't stand out. Like, the, the only thing he says about it are those two adjectives. It was hard and dreary. And there's not much to say except the wind. That was memorable. For many sunless days, an icy blast came from the mountains in the east, and no garment seemed able to keep out its searching fingers. Though the company was well clad, they seldom felt warm, either moving or at rest. Um, this wind, right? So we have this um, a, a, an overview, a two-adjective overview of an uneventful but very unpleasant time of hard and dreary journey. But then there's the wind. And what does the wind add? On the one hand, the wind adds to this tactile experience, right? These are, this is the image that was, you know, so many of you in your first comments were, were talking about these, right? Um, the searching fingers of the icy wind, right? Um, that is sort of searching and, poking and uh, 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 reaching through any every garment that they have. Um, they've got lots of warm clothes, but they seldom felt warm. Um, and again, think of how, again, we've all been there, right? I think most of us have experienced that before. Not just the experience of being cold, right? Um, but the experience of just not being warm for a really prolonged time. And again, this is not, it's not trying to say that there's real suffering happening here, right? That there's, you know, there's not, there's not pain and frostbite and everything. It's, it's not, uh, in a sense, it's not dangerous yet, right? It's just uncomfortable. Um, and, and it doesn't claim to be anything but uncomfortable. Again, though the company was well clad, really emphasizes that, right? Though the company was well clad, helps us to remember, like, no one's freezing here, right? You know, so don't picture somebody in like a, you know, a thin, like in thin, inappropriately, like seasonally inappropriate thin garments, you know, shivering and going into hypothermia. They're not going into hypothermia, right? They're just never warm. Like you just can't, you never, night and day, you never ever get really warm. Right. And the 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 pervasive chill, that that sense of never ending, uh, never ending discomfort, the way that that kind of saps you. Right. Um, is um, it's a big deal. Right. I mean, it's it's uh, it's and it's very evocative for this. This is this is um, and notice how it fits also with hard and dreary. Right. Kind of capturing the spirit, as it were, of this part of the journey. Um, it's the one memorable thing, that wind, right? Now, what's the function of the wind? As several of you were talking about, um, uh, as several of you were talking about, he, Tolkien, there's Tolkien anthropomorphizing the wind again. He does this a lot, doesn't he? Um, yes, and Blood the Inspirer, I do think that this is it is suggestive, suggestive possibly of Frodo's own perspective, but also possibly of, I think it forebodes a couple different things, right? We do have Karathras in the foreground, right? Um, of the, we're, we're, we're approaching Karathras. So there is a foreshadowing of what is about to happen with Karathras, for sure. But of course, that itself is only an image of what's to come, right? And this is the kind of pattern that we see in Tolkien lots and lots of times. These kinds of parallels, um, this sort of, um, you know, like Karathras is going to be like a type of Mount Doom itself, right? Just as Karathras the spirit is like a type of Sauron's own malice, right? Um, yes, there is a mountain in the east Right, capital E, um, from which searching fingers, searching, 
is important, right? He's been sending out, Sauron has sent out searchers, right? The ring wraiths have come forth like the searching fingers of Sauron's hand. Oh, wait, there are nine of them. Um, yeah, that's how many fingers Sauron has, in fact, on his hands, isn't it? He has nine fingers total because he lost one. Um, so anyway, he sent out his nine searching fingers from the mountains in the east, right? From Mordor, uh, searching for Frodo, particularly, not just sweeping the land, right? And again, that's the other significance, I think, to that image of searching fingers. It's not just reaching fingers. It's not just, it's not, it's not something that is just like sweeping across the countryside. It's coming for you, right? Um, and of course, again, I, I like, on the one hand, it's very evocative of a physical sensation that many of us have had. I mean, when when the wind is cutting through the clothes that you're wearing, I mean, it does kind of. I mean, it can almost feel like, um, you know, the wind is 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 taking aim at like every little gap in your coat, right? Every little uh, every little um, you know the little gap between your gloves and your sleeve or whatever, right? Like it's, it's aiming at all of the weaknesses. And, and of course it's, it's not, you shouldn't take it personally, right? It's not about you except with Frodo it kind of is right. Or at least he could be forgiven for thinking so. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so yes, I love that, uh, the searching, that word seems really significant in that way. Um, um, Again, do I think that he is, you know, Tolkien is suggesting the wind is actually the will of Sauron? No, of course not, right? Um, any more than that red star in the south really was the malevolent will of Sauron um, looking down on him, right? But that's where Frodo's mind goes when he sees it, right? Um, and this is where Frodo's mind is going when this, and I think this is one of the reasons why the wind is the thing that he remembers most about this stage of the journey, right? Um, because it <clears throat> does seem in his mind to serve as a metaphor for what they're doing, as a kind of image um, for what for what they're doing. Um, yeah, and Dan, you're absolutely right. Um, we will see when the, with the t talk of Sauron's arm growing long. Frodo isn't the only one who's going to be considering the active possibility that Sauron may in fact be involved in this wind itself. Um, we can't even dismiss that completely because Gandalf seems unwilling to dismiss it completely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Um, they slept uneasily during the middle of the day in some hollow of the land or hidden under the tangled thorn bushes that grew in thickets in many places. So here we are given some visual imagery. Right? We got that tactile imagery of the wind, right? And now we're giving some we're given some visual imagery. That is, we we are invited to picture their camp. Um, we're told they seldom felt warm, either moving or at rest. That either moving or at rest, the or at rest kind of transitions us into thinking like. We're picturing them trotting along hard and dreary, right? So the dreary seems to speak to their affect and attitude, right? The hard helps us to picture how they're walking. Um, the, um, you know, the the searching fingers, right, helps us to, to feel what they were feeling while they were walking. Um, but then, yeah, it didn't even get better, right? When they could lie down and wrap up in blankets, Right. Even then they weren't warm. What were they doing? Well, now we get we can picture this. Right. Them sleeping uneasily during the middle of the day. So we, we have this. It's, we know it's dreary. So we're not imagining bright sunshine. Of course, we also know it's the middle of winter. Right. Um, but uh, so we've got the middle of the winter day, uh, the dreary gray uh, uh, middle of the winter's day in some hollow of the land or hidden under the tangled thorn bushes in some hollow of the land right the fact that they're camping in a hollow shows possibly like one of the motivations is to get out of the wind right and yet there's a there's a futility in that right a hollow of the land 
that's not shelter, right? Um, uh, definitely not real shelter. Um, and yet it's all they have, right? Or hidden under the tangled thorn bushes that grew in thickets in many places. Also not a comfortable image. Um, hiding under thorn bushes. Um, you know, any sudden movement you make, you might, you know, stab yourself with uh, thorns and stuff, right? Um, very, um, um, very difficult. I get uh, very comfortless, right? Thorn bushes, definitely not associated with comfort. So even the, the shelter that they find, Right. They either have no real shelter. They're either vainly hoping for some kind of shelter and not finding it in some hollow of the land or they're finding shelter. And it's the most inhospitable kind of shelter that you can imagine. Right. Um, hiding under tangled thorn bushes um, that are growing in thickets. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in the late afternoon, they were roused by the watch and took their chief meal. Um, so notice in both in the they slept uneasily sentence and in the late afternoon sentence, um, we are getting a description of their routine, right? We don't get a description of any day. We just get a general description of all the days, right? This is what this whole part of the journey was like. Sleeping uneasily because you can't get warm and you're exposed and and uncomfortable and miserable. Um, and then you're roused in the late afternoon and you take your chief meal. Hooray. It's time for the big meal of the day, which is cold and cheerless as a rule for they could seldom risk the lighting of a fire. Right? So no fire, just eating cold food with cold hands huddled still in your blankets, right? As your uh, as the wind is, cutting through, like, whist, you know, it's probably seething, I bet you, uh, in the, uh, in the tangled thorn bushes, right? Or, uh, um, you know, um, uh, sort of howling over the hollow that they're, uh, that they're huddled in. Um, yeah, so that, and that joyless, the word joyless there, right, really picks up on the dreariness of the first line um, and kind of frames the stuff that, you know, we get um, dreary, uh, not, not joyless, sorry, cheerless. Cheerless is the word that we get, right? Dreary and cheerless, cold and cheerless as a rule. Their meals are cold, right? Of course, everything's cold. They're cold. Um, though, notice the first time we've gotten that word in this paragraph, right? We have been invited to imagine how cold they are. But he's not actually said that they're cold. He said that they're seldom warm, right? Um, and that the blast is icy, and they can't keep the they can't keep it out. Though they have, uh, though they they are well clad, right? Um, but the first time we actually get the word cold is um, the first time we get the word cold is to describe their meals, right? Um, their meals are cold, which is like the final insult, right? The, the one thing that they could hope might be warm uh, could be their meals, but no, cold and cheerless. Um, as a rule, right? As a rule is interesting because um, they, um, uh, on the one hand, it simply means most of the time, right? Right? The majority of the time, their meals were cold and cheerless. Um, that is, it's uh, it's it's the corresponding expression to the word seldom. They could seldom risk the lighting of a fire. Sometimes they lit a fire, right? The minority of the times, they lit a fire, which means that, as a rule, most of the time, their meals were cold and cheerless. Um, but, of course, the sense of... Um, right, exactly, Evil Dr. Evil Dr. Cannon is saying it's, it's the norm. Right. Um, but um, but at the same time, the implications of as a rule, right, um, the implications of that phrase are it's almost like um, like it has to be this way. Right. Like like who passed that? Who made that rule? 
right? Who, who passed the cold and cheerlessness rule? Well, somebody did, right? Um, uh, exactly, praise. Gandalf made it a rule. It's Gandalf's rule, right? Um, uh, I think it's probably not the Hobbit's idea to have cold meals most of the time, right? Um, so Gandalf, Aragorn, some combination of the two of them have in fact laid down a rule that they're not going to have a fire unless they are confident um, that they can hide it, right? For they could seldom risk the lighting of a fire. Sometimes they can risk it under whatever the exact circumstances are, right? That they feel that they can risk the lighting of a fire. Um, but it doesn't happen that often. And so you get that sense of both the norm, their normative experience was cold and cheerless meals, but it's not quite as impersonal as that, right? Um, the leader of their party has decreed that their meals shall be cold and cheerless. And that's awful, <laughs> right? There's this sense of external oppression upon them as well, right? As if the hard and dreary journey with the searching fingers of the icy blast of wind weren't bad enough, right? Um, now they're being forced to eat cold meals and never get warm because they can never have a fire. Um, in the evening, they went on again, always as nearly southward as they could find a way. Um, I love the indirectness of that. Once again, we're getting the end of the standard day, which is setting off on another journey, right? But there isn't even the sense of like, and on we shall plod slowly but steadily, you know, uh, through the hard land into the south, as nearly southward as they could find a way. Man. Okay, so maybe on some days they make a fair bit of southward progress. But on some days, they might not get very far south at all, right? Um, and they end uh, another hard and dreary day. Um, not really any significantly closer to their destination than, than they were when they started it, right? There's a sense of, uh, not of total futility. It's not like they're never getting anywhere. But of... Um, highly qualified sense of progress, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, notice what, um, uh, notice what Tolkien is accomplishing here in this paragraph. Um, some authors, when describing long journeys, long, hard, dreary, cheerless journeys of their protagonists um, make you feel it by dragging you through day after day, right? Um, I'm going to describe the next day in which almost nothing happened, right? I can't help but think of the hard and dreary camping in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, right? Which always saps my spirit before I come to the end of it. Um, uh, yeah, Bjorning in Exile, you were thinking exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah, like that's that's one approach, right, to conveying hardness and dreariness, right? Um, Tolkien accomplishes that effect in one paragraph, right? Um, by, and he not only, and he does it, but he, he does it not just in a remote way. He doesn't just, he doesn't just tell us, right? He could have just said, and um, they were mere, weary and miserable and always cold, um, and, you know, they really hated it. Um, but he doesn't do it. He helps us to feel it. He helps us to see it. He helps us to get a sense of, we don't even know exactly how long this is going on. We're not told any, we're not given any time frame, right? We're just told it's the first part of their journey. This could have been days. This could have been weeks or months for all we know based on this paragraph, right? And yet we get this sense of monotony combined with discomfort and depression, right? Um, and, uh, 
Uh, and he accomplishes all this in a very short space of time. Um, and also in some very present ways. Again, that's why I say the narrative perspective is quite different in this paragraph than that, like, sort of map overview perspective that we were getting a couple paragraphs back, right? Or the marching order explanation. Um, you know, here's some information about the party and how it functioned so that you can begin to get a glimpse of the, you know, sort of internal politics of the Company of the Ring, right? Which we got in the paragraph right before this. Now, we're getting the experience, but we're not getting a, a journal of this journey. We're getting this, I think, really effective um, one paragraph overview. Um, yeah, it is true, Jackie. We're being invited um, to connect this to our own personal experience instead of reading on and on about the character's misery. Right. Exactly. We don't we don't get told how the characters feel again and again. Right. We're just told their circumstances in some suggestive words, words like dreary and cheerless uh, are are. Um, um, they feature. Right. And those are weighted. Those those give us some promptings in understanding um, how they were feeling. But they're not just they're not. We're not just told. Right. We're not just told how the characters are feeling on this day and the next day and the next day. Um, uh yeah, I feel like um, one of the words which seems to me to establish a theme for this paragraph is the word seldom. I think we only get it twice, but it seems important, right? Um, seldom. They seldom felt warm. They could seldom risk the lighting of a fire. Um, anything good, anything warm, anything cheerful, uh, anything friendly. Um, it's not that it never happened but it happened seldom, right? And that's, again, this is not this is very far from the worst they're going to experience, right? In fact, it's almost as far as can be. Well, no, they're going to be happier than this on many occasions, more comfortable than this on lots of occasions. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, this is not, he's not overdoing it, right? Um, and yet, it's, uh, it's pretty grim. Um, Jackie, we only ever know from the... Um, we only ever know from the appendices exactly how long this is. Um, we don't get any... And that's an interesting thing um, to track, actually. Um, sometimes, some people are fond of, like, reading the book with, like, one finger in at Appendix B, right, to kind of keep... And that's fun to do. And I think Tolkien invited that by including such a detailed calendar. Um, for, you know, the, the, you know, the great years and stuff. Um, and that's cool. And that's really fun. I mean, if you don't do that, then you don't even learn that it was Christmas Day when they set out from Rivendell. Um, but I also think that it's really interesting not to do that and instead just to look at the experience that the narrative itself gives us, right? Um, and one of the reasons I think it's so interesting to do that is that we can see the two different ways in which Tolkien built this, right? That is, on the one hand, we know that he was very meticulous, right? As he wrote this paragraph, Tolkien knew exactly. Now, he tweaked and changed it, right, to accommodate other things as he went along, but he knew exactly how long this was, right? Not only does he know exactly how many days they traveled here, um, he knows exactly how many miles they've covered, right, on this trip. Um, but um, he, uh, but he doesn't mention it here, right? Although we know that he has all of this stuff worked out very meticulously and could tell us, you know, exactly what phase the moon is in at this particular time, you know, on these particular days, right? Like which calendar day this, these are and what the phases of the moon were at every given point. We know that he can do that. And yet it's amazing to me how little that shows up in the text, how restrained he is in manifesting that. He doesn't even succumb to the temptation just to toss it in in an overview kind of way, right? Like he could have mentioned in this paragraph how many days, the first part of their journey was, right? Um, 
he could have worked that in very naturally, right? You know, he could have been like, um, you know, I don't know, like for, yeah, you know, 14 dreary days, right? They went, whatever. Um, but he, he doesn't say that, right? He doesn't do that at all. Um, which again, given how carefully we know he worked all this stuff out and not just in retrospect, some of the appendix stuff is in retrospect, um, but not just in retrospect. Um, he doesn't succumb to that temptation very often, um, which I think is interesting. I think that's important, right? Um, and certainly very, it tells us some interesting things about how he's how he conceives of the narrative perspe perspective of the story, right? But now look, when then we get the second shift, right? Um, at first it seemed to the hobbits that although they walked and stumbled until they were weary, they were creeping forward like snails and getting nowhere. Each day the land looked much the same as it had the day before, yet steadily the mountains were drawing nearer. South of Rivendell they rose ever higher and bent westwards, and about the feet of the main range there was tumbled an ever wider land of bleak hills and deep valleys filled with turbulent waters. Paths were few and winding, and led them often only to the edge of some sheer fall or down into treacherous swamps. Notice the cue that we get at the beginning of, that, of this paragraph, right? At first it seemed to the hobbits. At first, it seemed to the hobbits. Um, now we're getting explicitly. The last paragraph, I think, was implicitly from the perspective of the hobbits, right? We got Frodo remembered little of it, right? So we get a, a reference to Frodo, but apart from that reference to Frodo, there is nothing else explicitly to connect um, the experiences and, and um, sort of perspective of that paragraph with hobbit perspective. The second one does so more explicitly, right? At first it seemed to the hobbits that. Um, now, what do we get in this paragraph that we didn't get in the previous paragraph? Or to ask that question a different way, what's happening in this paragraph? Why do we get this paragraph? What does this paragraph give us that the last one didn't do? It was easy to see what the last one gave us, right? What the first paragraph on this slide gives us that the paragraphs before didn't give us, right? Before we got a geographical overview, we could follow where they were going on the map and we knew why, right? Um, and we know who's in charge, right? Um, uh, and we know who's more important than Boromir. Sorry, uh, Legolas. But um, <laughs> just teasing Boromir there. Just joking, Boromir. It's all good. Um, but um, I... We get, we certainly get something new in the, you know, about the journey. Like we can picture and feel this journey, um, in our minds and bodies. Right. Um, but what do we get here now in this last paragraph? We don't get what they felt, not their physical sensations. That's what we were getting in that last paragraph. Right. What are we getting here? At first it seemed to the hobbits that although they walked and stumbled until they were weary, they were creeping forward like snails and getting nowhere. Right? Um, you see what's, see what's happening here that didn't happen in the last paragraph? What we're getting is what the hobbits think of all of this, right? what they experienced, what they felt, um, what Frodo remembers, like physically remembers of what the journey was like on a day-to-day -day basis. We're getting that in the previous paragraph, right? Now, um, we're getting what they were thinking about. How, what did it seem to them like, right? Notice we get a simile in that first sentence, which is interesting, right? An explicit comparison. What did it seem like? It seemed like they were creeping forward like snails and getting nowhere. That's what it seemed like, 
to the hobbits, right? Here's their impression, their actual thoughts and feelings, not their experiences and their physical sensations, but their thoughts and feelings about what was happening. And what is happening is snail-like progress, creeping forward like snails, getting nowhere. Each day the land looked much the same as it had the day before. No progress. Really boring. Right? Yet steadily the mountains were drawing nearer. Okay, so not no progress. Slow progress. No change. No variety. Right? Um, but slow progress. Um, steadily the mountains were drawing nearer. And then we get a description of the mountains. South of Rivendell, they rose ever higher and bent westwards. And about the feet of the main range, there was tumbled an ever wider land of bleak hills and deep valleys filled with turbulent waters. Great. Okay, so the land looked much the same as it had the day before, right? So if it's doing anything, it's getting worse, right? Um the ever wider land of bleak hills, right? So the mountains are, they're getting closer to the mountains because the mountains are bending westwards, right? They're heading south and the mountains are bending westwards. Um, so the the way is getting even rougher. Notice where they walked and stumbled until they were weary, right? Again, this is showing their internal, their internal perspective. He made us feel their weariness, um, though weariness was not the primary um, emphasis, right? That the cold and cheerlessness uh, of it, but still, it was hard, right? Uh, we, that sense of weariness and not even being able to rest uh, well, sleeping uneasily, right? So we had a sense of weariness certainly in the previous paragraph, but but now we're told um, we're told here how they feel, right? Um, and as well as seeing them walking and stumbling until they were weary, right? Not just stumbling with weariness. They were stumbling prior to becoming weary, right? They were stumbling and then they got weary, right? And then it got even worse. And then meanwhile, the bleak hills in which they're stumbling are getting ever wider and now filled with deep valleys filled with turbulent waters. So it's not just hard and uncomfortable. It's becoming in places impassable, right? Um, but notice one side element, right? Although their primary experience is of creeping forward like snails, that feel, that sensation that they're getting nowhere, yet they do notice things changing. Steadily the mountains were drawing nearer, South of Rivendell, they rose ever higher. Remember, this is a big deal, right? None of the hobbits have ever seen mountains before. The Misty Mountains, when they approached Rivendell, was Bilbo's first ever sight of mountains. We're told explicitly he'd never seen mountains before, right? Um, and was wondering if these were, if one of those was the mountain, right? Um, we have to assume that none of the other, none of the four hobbits on this trip have seen mountains any more than Bilbo has before now, right? Um, so the mountains around Rivendell were the first mountains they've ever seen. But the mountains, uh, south of Rivendell, the mountains rose ever higher, right? So the mountains are becoming even more mountainous, right? The further they go. They thought those were really impressive mountains. Now the mountains are getting more and more intimidating as they go south and get deeper and deeper into the wild. Um, again, the mountains themselves are growing. So they're observing the overall, the, 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 the big picture land changes around them. Their own experience of the world is continuing to broaden as they're drawing near to the mountains. They're beginning to uh, climb around in the foothills, right? This uh, wider land of bleak hills and deep valleys, right? Rivendell was kind of like that too, but this is even more, right? Uh, we're told. Paths were few and winding and led them often only to the edge of some sheer fall or down into treacherous swamps. 
Um, now, a couple of you were, um, uh, a couple of you were commenting that um, Aragorn and Gandalf seem to be doing a bad job, right? Um, if Aragorn knows the land even in the dark, is he deliberately leading them to dead ends? That, you know, to cliff faces and, and down into treacherous swamps. Um, and I think my response to that is, I doubt it. I doubt it. I bet you the route that they're taking is a pretty good one. Um, remember, this paragraph begins with, at first, it seemed to the hobbits. Right? <clears throat> and I think that that still kind of applies. Um the paths that there are might lead them to the edge of some fall or down into treacherous swamps. But I bet you the route that Aragorn is, and that Aragorn and Gandalf are planning to take them on, um, is uh, not just tied to those few and winding paths, right? Um, most of the rest of the time, they're not on what the hobbits would call a path at all, right? And I think that sort of that's the point there. Um, to them, how does it seem to the hobbits? Like they're lost. Like they're, like they're headed nowhere. Um, they don't seem to worry that they're going around in circles, I think, because they trust Strider and they trust Gandalf. And they do have the sort of affirmation of what they see happening big picture, like the mountains, right? Um, although... They're only creeping forward like snails. Even snails get somewhere eventually, right? Steadily, the mountains are, in fact, drawing nearer. So, yes, they're, they're not going around in circles. They're definitely um, going as nearly southward as they could find a way. Um, but they don't understand their route. And it looks to them like dead ends all over the place. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Arden Crayon, you're right that Aragorn did sometimes do um, double back when leading the hobbits out of the Bree country as a countermeasure against spies. Um, one wonders, are they um, choosing, you know, this is Mr. My Cuts Short or Long Don't Go Wrong, right? Who is uh, going to be guiding them on this trip here. And um, I... But I can see lots of reasons to think that they're not just taking the easiest and fastest route, right? Um, I bet you that Gandalf and Aragorn both know a better, a less hard, maybe not less dreary, I don't know what they can do about the dreariness, but I bet you they could have found a less hard route. I bet you that there could be, that there are ways in which they could get down more easily than they're doing. But I bet you that Aragorn and Gandalf are deliberately choosing ways that are harder and more obscure and more inaccessible. And so will seem to the hobbits as if they're constantly coming up onto down into treacherous swamps. That doesn't mean they didn't go through the treacherous swamps. They might have done, right? Um, Gandalf and Aragorn might have deliberately led them into a treacherous swamp. And led them out again. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, I agree. It is also true um, that um, it is also possible that, you know, just because you... Now, we're told that initially that Aragorn knew the land even in the dark. I don't know that that's still true. Right. Um, the intimacy of Aragorn's familiarity with this country now that they're further south may, in fact, be less than his, it, it was the area right around Rivendell. That was the description from when they were near the Fort of Bruinen. Right. Um, when they turned and left the road and set out across country at the beginning, that was the land that we were told explicitly that Aragorn knew even in the dark. Um, and Valora, you're sure right that a lot can change in 40 years. Um, uh, or even a few years. Um, but, um, uh, anyway, um, yeah, Jackie says the foothills would change every season. Certainly the seasons would have a significant difference, um, in, uh, uh, 
in this land that they're that they're traveling in. But um, anyway, um, but as I said, secrecy, um, making it harder to track them. Um, that's probably a thing that they're thinking of. Um, remember, they explicitly said this. Their hope was that anyone set to pick up their trail would have to go to Rivendell first. So they are imagining not just the possibility of someone spotting them as they go or someone lying await for, for them in front, but of someone tracking them from behind. And so I bet you um, a trip through a treacherous swamp or two was done quite deliberately in order to help throw people off their trail or any tracking beast that might be tracking them by scent as well. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I do think that um, we have every reason to believe that the Hobbit's perception of what's happening is not, this, is, this paragraph is not giving us Aragorn and Gandalf's perspective. Right. And so once again, the narrative perspective of this paragraph has shifted and it's shifted in the direction of um, seeing things through the Hobbit's eyes specifically in this paragraph. Right. And they don't they don't know. They don't see the big picture. They don't get it. This is how they look. Right. We find a path and it leads us right to the edge of a sheer fall. Great. Right. Um, this doesn't mean, I think, that Gandalf and Aragorn are puzzled and surprised. There might be occasions in which they're puzzled and surprised if something changed. Could happen. Um, but again, this is not about what Gandalf and Aragorn were actually doing. This is about the Hobbit's perception of it. Um, yes, ADR, I do agree. Um, Gandalf has been south several times, um, but he almost certainly just took the Greenway when he went south before, right? Um, on what occasion would Gandalf have been like, let me explore the hard, uneven, broken, and inefficient to travel in country, uh, you know, just to the west of the mountains here between Rivendell and, you know, the passes. Um, I mean, I don't think this is would even be necessarily... Let's, hang on, let's uh, go up to the map for a second. If you were headed down to Lorien... I'm not even convinced that that would be the fastest way. Um, wouldn't it be? I bet you it would be faster. You could probably go down the river, couldn't you? Um, I mean, I don't know how navigable the Bruinen is. Um, it's called the Loudwater, which suggests maybe not very navigable. Um, but uh, but anyway, like even if you're headed for the Dimril Stair down here it's not obvious to me that the route they're taking is necessarily the fastest route, right? Again, which presumably most of the time um, he has traveled this way before, Gandalf was probably looking for the fastest route. I can't imagine that this area south of Rivendell and north of Holland is a patch of country that Gandalf has gone to on purpose many times in his career, right? Um yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he's been around lots of places, Carnemirier, but again, he's not... The difference, I think, between Aragorn's relationship with the countryside and Gandalf's... Gandalf is a traveler, but Aragorn, like, has patrolled, right? You know, the, the rangers are keeping an eye on the lands... I mean, we're told explicitly that around the Shire. Um, but even, again, the trips of the scouts, I don't think this is, like, the only time. This, I mean, you know, the, the scouting expeditions uh, between the Council of Elrond and the departure from Rivendell were presumably a larger effort, right, than um, uh, was normal, you know, in those days. And yet, um, I do think... Again, there's a reason Aragorn knows that country off of the road, even in the dark, right? He's been all over this place a lot, um, patrolling, exploring, um, scouting for various things. Um, I don't see Gandalf having done that. He's been many places, right? Um, uh, I'm sure he's made the direct Rivendell to Lothlorien trip 
more than once in his career, right? But that doesn't mean he knows every twist and turn of this country, right? Um, he was going from one place to another place. And I don't, when I say he went on purpose, um, sorry, that's an old expression of mine. Um, uh, I, I use that expression if like, you know, when you, when you go to, um, maybe there's a town or even a state that you're familiar with because you've often driven through it. Right. Um, like it's, it's a, it's a stage on your journey. Uh, but you've never like, it's never been your destination, right? Um, you know, for me, uh, for me, that was New Jersey, right? Uh, I almost never went to New Jersey on purpose. Uh, that is, rarely did I set out in New Jersey was my destination, right? But I very, very frequently crossed through New Jersey, right? Going back and forth um, between the Mid-Atlantic region and New England. Um, so, um, I, uh, or towns locally, right? There are some towns around here that like I've never set out uh, you know, on a trip from my house where that t something in that town was what I was going to, right? I've driven past the town. I've driven through the town lots of times, uh, but I've never like actually set out for that town before. That's so my, uh, I started using this expression when I was a kid uh, to say like, we're going there on purpose, right? Um, in that sense, I don't think Gandalf's ever been here on purpose before. Aragorn might've been, right? There might've been like some scouting trip or something that he was doing where he was deliberately checking out this area for something or other, right? That I could imagine having come up. Um, but, um, uh, but, but Gandalf, I think he was more of a bigger picture destination kind of traveler, right? Um, he knows the road between Bree and Rohan, right? I'm sure he's traveled the Greenway a bunch of times. Uh, but I bet you he stuck mostly to the Greenway. And, you know, maybe he had reason to wander in Dunland. Maybe he went to visit people in Dunland for some reason in the past. That's possible, right? That kind of thing. But, like, has he really explored around Enidwife, right? Where there aren't that many people, right? I, I doubt it, right? I doubt it. Maybe. Um, but, um, anyway, uh, this is... Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, Kansas seems to be a popular example of this for uh, for people. Yeah, I um, I hear you. I hear you. Um, uh, I, I can imagine Kansas being a uh, a similar kind of uh, uh, kind of destination there, um, or non destination place you go through, but not too uh, very often. Um, yeah, cool. Anyway, okay. Uh, anyway, but enough of speculation about Gandalf's travel uh, capacities. So anyway, um, all right. With that, we're going to stop for the night. I'm running a little bit late this evening here, but uh, we got through. This is a long slide. Two fat paragraphs here this evening. Um, uh, next time, more road trip, right? Um and again, I want to be focusing on a, on continuing. And this is how I think these narrative passages are really so interesting to look at closely, because we can see this change in perspective, e the new thing that each paragraph is doing. So tune in next week for two more paragraphs to see what more we do as we continue on the trip. Um, but... Um, very good. So thanks, everybody, for joining us who can ju is just joining us for our book discussion. It's field trip time. Uh, so we're going to we're going to head off. Today is an exciting field trip, by the way, as we're going to be doing uh, our own walking tour. We're doing a thematic thing. We're doing a walking tour of the Shire today. So that, that'll be exciting. So we're going to fellow up here. So today we're not doing any swift travel. We're not doing any um, milestoning. We're just going to set off on horseback from Bree, and we're going to get ourselves at least to the new zone. Uh, so for those of you who are less familiar with Lotro or who are new to this, um, there's a new area, a new zone in Lotro that they just opened up. And it's called the Yonder Shire up here. So you've got the Breeland and you've got the Shire here with Hobbiton and Mickle Delving. So the Shire map um, that has been, you know, familiar since the very beginning of the game. Um, they go these this this has been these these have been the boundaries of the travelable Shire um, ever since uh, we 
you know, ever since the game opened, um, you can't get to the, it says two south farthing at the bottom of the map, but don't let that deceive you. You can't get to the south farthing, in fact. You know, so you've got from Mickle Delving, um, and you, nor can you get to the far downs, by the way. That also doesn't exist. So we've got these two deceptive or perhaps um, uh, uh, promissory uh, map directions here. Um, but we get Mickle Delving, we get Tuckborough, we get, you know, the, of course, the main line of the path uh, out, you know, that the that the company, you know, that Frodo and, and Pippin and Sam take um, out to uh, towards Breeland. Um, then we get a little bit of the North Country, right? We've got Hobbiton in the Hill up to Brocken Borings and Scary, um, which are all mentioned in the text. Um, and then you've got Needle Hole, which is a little town in the far north uh, north uh, western corner, which is sort of the route out to the um, uh, t- towards the Blue Mountains, right? This is the Dwarf Road where the dwarves mm-hmm. would come down and travel through in order to come through the middle of the Hobbit on their road uh, to get uh, in out into the east. Um, so you're able to travel up from here into the Lake Evendim area. So we can see there's a numinous, uh, right? So you can see the way that we get um, connected out to Old Arnor, right? We can see how close the Shire was to the center of Old Arnor, which was fun. Uh, and as I say, back out to the Bree land. But the new place that we get here is Yondershire. So we go out to the big map. This zone, we went like basically straight up here to Evendim without, or you could go out past Needle Hall and out towards the Arid Luin out here where Thorin's Hall and the, uh, and not the Elf Havens themselves, but some of the last settlements of elves out here. Um, uh, th- those were the directions we used to get. So Yondershire is Lotro filling in this chunk of map. What is just north of the North Farthing? What uh, areas do we get there? So we are headed for um, Yondershire from this. So our goal is to strike out across country and get at least toward, at least into, um, or at least to the edge of Yondershire from here. So that's a little background on where we're going and what's going on here. Um, but um, but all right. So I think um, I'm not planning on questing um uh as we go we're just going to stick to our normal archaeo gaming as we go through uh, so if you know anything about the quests in yondershire don't tell me um i'm keen to guess based on what we see based on the uh the evidence that we can see um we'll figure out what kind of country this is and what's going on here um, so that's what I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually really excited to be exploring Yondershire, uh, here with Narnian and our crew of Archeo gamers instead of, um, going through, um, uh, instead of going through the quests first, because we can get to kind of see it objectively first. So it'll be, it'll be fun. Okay. So let's, um, let's head out. We, we, you got, you guys are all set with, um, the, uh, raid and stuff. I think so. Um, if I failed to add you, or if you weren't able to click on it in time, just uh, send me a DM. Uh, for Lori. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we're not going Oop. to be terribly deadly territory right now. Right, no, it won't be deadly territory. It's pretty low level. Sorry, yeah, Valori, your sound is still breaking up a little bit, which is... Uh, I'm sorry. Too bad. It's okay. We'll we'll live with it, but... Um, it's, I actually ordered a new mic during your life. So. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it is the mic. We'll see. Yeah. Um, all right. So off we head. I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm not worst eating it, by the way. I'm normal steeding it. Um, uh, so we can, we can, we're going to enjoy the full luxurious ride here. So here we are heading out the West Gate of Bree. So this is the West Gate of Bree with, um, um, where is, hey, where's Harry Goatleaf? Isn't he? Oh, there he is. <laughs> lounging against the lounging against the pillar there. Okay, so yeah, this is the this is the west gate which Harry is supposed to be guarding, which he's doing rather imperfectly, as is probably to be expected of him. And uh, here's of course the great crossroads with the greenway headed south, and then again north up towards Fornost. Um, so the great crossing of the way, which inspired the building of Bree in the first place, and the presumably pretty old bridge. Uh, crossing the river there 
on the Dwarf Road. So, of course, we've explored this area long ago as we passed through here in the narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, but, of course, there's a lot of, especially of the Shire, we're a little bit more thorough in the Brelands when we... Um, um, when we got here, but um, we were less completionist with our Shire explorations when we started, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think we weren't as detail oriented at the time. Right. You know, because of course we were hustling through the narrative itself at that point. Well, by the time we really got to traveling across the Shire, that is by the time we got to chapter three, we were, uh, we were pretty well moving slowly through the text, but, um, Young and hasty. these orange flowers, are they new? Hmm? I don't remember these orange flowers. Maybe it's just me. Been a while, been a long time since I've been here. So, but I, I think it's also I've I've either not been here at all or been here very seldom since the uh, beautification uh, of the of these lands. Um, <laughs> this is one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, do a slow ride, you know, a, a cross country jaunt here this evening. It doesn't take really that long to do it, but I wanted to kind of appreciate the uh, um, the countryside here. But um, I agree, JJ, Adso's team is making very slow work of that new inn, I have to say. It's a front. Yeah, yeah. You do have to wonder what... Yeah, exactly. I think uh, think Adso must have something else in mind, really, than actually building a... We know he's had dealings with Bill Fernie. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good look. And of course, this stretch of road that we're riding down is, of course, story-wise, the stretch of road that Frodo never traveled. Um, you know, we right next to Bree, we got to the path where he would have come out from the Barrow Downs um, so, uh, and rejoined the road right outside of Bree as we get in the narrative. Um, so this is the part of the, this is the dangerous sector of the road that he was skipping lest the Black Riders find him on this road. Um, But again, you notice how uh, one of the things that's kind of dramatized, and of course I'm not saying that the landscape here in Lotro is exactly the same as it was in Tolkien's mind, um, and yet it does really suggest, you know, when I talk about Uh, when I talked at the beginning about how much Frodo's perspective had changed and how much Frodo has grown up, um, the more you think about it, the more the decision to go into the old forest really does sound uh, kind of boneheaded, right, and desperate. Like, on the one hand, yeah, you don't want to be on the road, but you could be off the road and yet not in the old forest. Like, there are some other options uh, that are open to you. Um, You could travel you know, alongside the road in the countryside, which presumably would have been much easier to travel through, you know, a quarter of a mile Winning off would have the been road. Safer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the old forest is, yes, unexpected. They wouldn't expect you to go that way. This, of course, on our right is the Golden Perch, where Pippin wanted to try the beer. As This is a little town of stock that we're traveling through mm-hmm. now. And I think we're supposed to... We need, do, do we need to pick up the... Um, Stable masters yeah, again, because mm-hmm. yes, they've undone the stable masters, or at least some of them. Well, okay, see, I see, I still have Brock and Borings and Mickle Delving, um, but there's oh, missing, others. Yeah, yeah, I'm like Needlehole, I don't have it's anymore. So, here. yeah, oh, Hobbiton, I don't have anymore. Either. Well, okay, I don't have the Swift travel version of it. Okay, so yes, we will we will make a point of stopping at uh, stable masters along the way here. Um, they yes. didn't have the swift travel for Abaddon before. Oh, that wasn't. Oh, right, that wasn't a swift travel option. Mm-hmm. Well, that's nice. They have it. That is very nice. And of course, here that's also funny. we are traveling the other stretch of road that Frodo was attempting to avoid um, mm-hmm. by cutting cross country. Right, this is where the what the shortcut was missing, so that they never actually got near Frog Morton, which is coming up on the right. Um, 
Bedford. Oh, this is Budford first, right? Yeah, right. We're not quite to Frogmorton yet. That's right. Yep. Right. Budford, which is mentioned in the text, but we never really get that close to it. Uh-oh. Lagging a little bit here. Okay. Yeah, rubber band. Yeah. All right. Right. This is Frogmorton up ahead. Okay. Man, boy, this is... Jeepers. Coming a, a very laggy uh, trip across the Shire indeed here for a moment. Hardly seems like we're making any progress. That's right. I feel like I'm creeping along like a snail. Like a snail. <gasps> yeah, maybe this is the... There we go. There's Frogmorton, which is alluded yeah. to uh, in the Scouring of the Shire, right? When they come back, um, mm -hmm. we get a reference to the floating log, the inn He's here. doing the reenactment, that's all. Frogmore. Yeah, exactly. Reenacting the snail-like pace, seeming to get nowhere. Um, yeah, that's it. I tried to take the red because of the lag. Exactly. exactly. Stay out of the populated areas. Yep, yep. Well, exactly. So, and and JJ's thinking this is probably why uh, uh, Frodo was choosing to ignore this road. Right? It was so laggy. He didn't want to come here. All right. And there's a, there's the three farthing stone. As uh, near the center of the Shire as no matter. And Bywater down on the right. Okay, now we should um, make a side trip into Hobbiton. Maybe a quick... Let's actually pop up to Tuckborough first. Is, is there a stable master that we're missing in Tuckborough too? Nope. Nope, okay. That's Hobbiton. Just Hobbiton. All right. Well, let's head down into Hobbiton then. Oh, that's right. There isn't a stable master in Tuckborough. Mm hmm I often wanted one, but there isn't one. Yeah, we though have it, to go to the snails quite a lot, don't we? Yeah, though it really does... Um, Good day. It really does demonstrate how um, uh, spoiled we got in the early game, right? I mean, I, I can remember when <clears throat> going like 300 meters to your next uh, quest destination seemed like a really, really long distance. Um, and where like, like from here to Tuckborough, right up the hill, I'm like, oh man, if only there were a stable master to get me quickly from one to the other, you know, compared to the distances in like Forakel or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So we don't want to go up towards Brock and Borings, though we have that stable master anyway. We still retained that one, as I recall. So let's go back through Waymeet. Is there? Do we, do we need to go to Mickle Delving to pick up the stable master there? Uh, Mickle Delving, everyone gets that one because it's one of the main hubs. It's one of the main hubs, right? Okay, so we got that one for free. So that one and Brock and Borings, we kept both of those, right? I think so. I'm not sure, but yeah, I think Needlehole's gone. So. Overheaded. I do recall us. Wondering what was up there in Needle Hole and make relations. So. Yeah, and I just love this view. I love how well they have patterned, um, very clearly, very explicitly, patterned this view on the famous painting of Hobbiton by the water that Tolkien mm -hmm. did. Um, you know, like the the scales and proportions are not quite the same. They couldn't be. Um, but. Uh, yeah, but I love it. You can see Bag End up there on top of the hill. Um, you can see Bagshot Row down below. There's the granaries at the foot of the hill. You can see the mill down there and Hobbiton uh, right in front of it. Um, I just this is was one of my favorite views in the game as far as like the the view which is most obviously and clearly directly inspired by one of Tolkien's own paintings. I, I just this is one yeah. always always been one of my favorite one of my favorite shots there. Okay, anyway. Mm -hmm. Off we go. Oh, I thought that was a warg rider, but no, it's just somebody riding a pig. Like you do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Heading off towards Waymeet, where we will take a turn, take a pivot. Um, uh -oh. If we can get there, we'll see. Okay. This lovely, quiet country in the heart of the Shire here. 
with our little stone fences and the cultivated land. The caravans. Right, yes, and Waymeet here. We got the we got the the Hobbit trailer park here in Waymeet. With the ruins. I love the ruins. We don't get many ruins here in the Shire, mm. right? Um, but we get this clear memory of uh, like this this is a this is an intersection. It's a pretty significant intersection of two old roads, right? Um, mm -hmm. So was this built maybe by, well, no, it's pretty clear. It was built by the Dunedain. Look at those yep. petals down there on what was clearly, uh, this was like a gazebo-esque kind of thing here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this was some kind of structure, not a major building, right? But some kind of structure for the, um, um, from Arnorian times uh, here yep. at the Meeting of the Ways. And I love this little uh, stone you know, the, this, the, the two stone pillars or three ones, right? Like uh, here, well, four, I guess. This one has the thing on top of it. Notice we've got these four stone, um, what? Little cairns, right? Little pillars there, which look very old. But I'm guessing, but, but I think they're clearly much newer than these ruins, right? So I, I'm guessing that what we're seeing here is three different layers of culture, right? I think mm -hmm. that first we get the Arnorian pillars, right? So there and, was some the kind of... Road. Right. And then I think probably dwarves. I think the dwarves probably did the four stone things to mark the intersection, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got a hobbit signpost erected on top of one of the dwarf uh, little stone pedestals right mm -hmm. yeah yeah oh yeah the so it, uh, sign does point to the south gate that we can't get through doesn't it um, yeah someday yeah someday. someday and this still that goes to needle hall the way to nickel delving and this goes to bywater and hobbiton okay mm -hmm. there we go um stop fighting someday. yeah yeah exactly yeah, the Shire still Homesteads. A lot to exp I'm still marveling just how many spaces there are still to fill on this map. It's true. It's true. Yep, Kendall, I agree. I look forward to taking the north-south road all the way to Gondor someday. Yes, that would be great. That'll be fun. But okay, all right, let's head up towards Needle Hall then. We'll find out the next big thing next month, which actually it's after midnight here. It is next month. That's true. It is next month. So here in June, we will, well, in June, I, uh, June in Valley Tala. Yes. I do know that the next producer's letter is already in the works. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So we now descend down from the hilly country into the lo lower areas. Now, this part of the Shire that we're entering into, we never get in the narrative. Um, yep. Because we never go further west or north, um, you know, of of, of than Hobbiton um, mm -hmm. during the narrative itself. Okay, west we go to the Grey Havens, but we don't get the Shire described out that way. Um, yeah, this has got to be a downer on your trip to the Grey Havens. You probably so, right? But I but we do have the Shire map, Tolkien Shire map to work with, and so that clearly inspired most of the things that we see needle hole as i recall is on the map um mm -hmm. and uh which is a lovely name for like a, a pass right um it's uh it marks the 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 pass in the hills or mountains uh that border that edge of the shire um these swamps i think are also featured on the map who do we think made this path here who made the stone Pillars. Dwarves? Probably dwarves. Hmm. Interesting that they haven't maintained it. This, these wooden ramp things can't possibly be dwarves. No, this is definitely Hobbit make. and uh, Definitely Hobbit make. But I think the... Probably needs to be redone every couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they send, they send a, a kid out there to test the rotten planks, and when he falls through, it's time to change him. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, 
Yeah. But it's interesting, Emma Thorne, if they've left the maintenance up to the hobbits, that's a fascinating choice, isn't it? Um, because the dwarves do still travel this road and would want, you would think, the freedom to travel it. See, this bridge is more like you would expect. Yeah, this is your proper... Yeah. It does make you feel like the, the other stone quiz for probably something that maybe shifted around or moved a bit. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. sort of maybe 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 the wooden bridge was uh, made way after the out of necessity, like the water rose and they needed it. Right, yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. Okay, and we we I remember doing our field trip to Needlehole before on our way through to Arid Lewin. Right, and we got here this clear dwarvish building, right? So we got this is the transition point where we have an, an obvious dwarvish like merchant outpost here, trading outpost, and um and then the little hobbit village. Wait, sorry, what was that? Oh no, he gets slapped all the time. Oh. oh like, there's a quest to go slap Onar. Oh right, right, right. Yes. All right, Hending Gamgee, one of the uh, Gamgees of the of, of uh, from the northern branch of Gamgees. That's cool. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, I think the rest of the stuff must be in Yondershire itself. So okay, well it is late. Yeah. Should we? Yes. Okay. No, it's really Let's get late. our first glimpse. Okay, okay, we can get the first glimpse, but just hang on a second. Before we get the first glimpse, is there a milestone here? Uh, nope. Just it's a stable. There's no milestone, just a stable? No, nope. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe who was to go ahead? I don't think we're going to make it to the first milestone, though. I don't even see any. Milestones marked on the map, anyway. And we can always start at Mickledown. Okay, all right. So we're looking at the Yondershire map. Okay, so there's overlap. So we can see Needle Hole is basically on the edge of the the map here. So let's head up towards No Bottle, the place where they apparently do not have bottles. And now here, we are beginning. We are nearing the place. Wait, where are we? Okay. They said there's a milestone and no bottle, so. Okay. Worth oh, there's a milestone there? Okay, cool. Yes, there's a milestone and no bottle, so. All right, so let's do the thing where we get to it without looking around too much. <laughs> okay, I remember exploring these bridges. This is a very, very dwarvish bridge there, zigzagging inefficiently back and forth across the river. Motions. The Russia. Oh, someone showing off. Oh, ooh, it's not all sparkly and gold anymore. Right. Uh, this is the gate that you used to pass through, and, and you couldn't just. Loon. Yeah, you couldn't just ride through, right? You got zapped yeah, to yeah, Erdlund yeah, yeah. from here. Yep. Right. Okay. So this is my like. If I go one step further, then I'll be further than I've ever been. Before, oh, look, and there's Bingo, right? There's Bingo Boffin just sitting there. Very cool. Looking sharp, can I just say? Bingo looking sharp there. Yeah. All right. So this is me not really... Oh, somebody harumphing. That can't be good. Okay, heading up towards No Bottle, where I will do the milestone, and then we'll look around next time. It's good that you've got nameplates turned off. Yes. Right. Okay. Very good. Oh, the music is different. Yes. Bill Champagne has been working on the music for Very many cool. years. Oh, hang on. I went the wrong way. We went the wrong way. Went the wrong way. Took a wrong turning here. Right. Town is down over the bridge. Okay. I like the willow trees. Uh oh. Oh, I rivendelled the bridge. No good. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. In my defense, I was hit by a lag at a very crucial juncture there. Uh, yeah, no, that'll do it. 
Okay. Fortunately, unlike Rivendell, there were really no consequences. All right, so I'm going to replace my Tom Lumren milestone. There we go. Okay. Interesting. Get the All right. Master. I'll get the stable master while I'm here too. Yeah. As a backup system, just in case. In case I stable, I use my milestone to travel 40 feet instead of several miles again. Okay. All right. I'm looking around and not looking. Not looking. What a town. This place is huge. Okay. All right. Okay, cool. All right. We shall explore next time and see what we find here in No Bottle uh, in the Yondershire. Very cool. All right. Thank you for joining us on our cross country expedition uh, to get to the Yondershire, the part of the map that was never before filled in, um, but now has been looking forward to exploring the rest of this country, all of these places. Gamwich, another Ost place, the North Moors. Can we go to the North Moors? Oh, man. Um, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, I can't wait yes, to go up there. I, I can't wait to go up there and not see elm trees. This is going to be fantastic. Um, <laughs> Uh, That's what I think. All right. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you guys next week. So the plan is I should be able to do Tuesdays until I think the week of Mythmoot. I'm not going to be able to do uh, even on Tuesday. I thought I might be able to do Tuesday night. I think I'm not going to be able to do Tuesday night that week. Um, Mythmoot is going to kind of dominate my week that week. So the week of Mythmoot, we, we, we won't be doing any broadcasts. Um, but we still have two more weeks after this until then. So we should be... And we got Myth Mood itself. And then we've got Myth Mood itself. Exactly. So... There will be a Lotro stream at Myth Mood. That's the plan. We'll be doing a Lotro stream at Myth Mood as we... As has been tradition. So... Awesome. Nice. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Now.